Losing the Plot Prologue I didn't have to turn around to know that Danny, my illustrious and demonic director of photography, was standing, or rather lurking, wraith-like behind me. He was fond of wearing one of those big North Face coats, and the combination of his height, his billowing mood of satanic menace, and the black-as-death coat made him a formidable presence on set. I tapped some random keys on my laptop and huddled closer to the screen. Perhaps he'd be fooled into thinking I was too busy to be disturbed. After all, I was the producer, the big cheese, the one who had foolishly hired the bastard. Maybe he'd respect my space and fuck off back to the land of make-believe. The film set, the place where dreams are made. Fat chance. James, have you got a minute? he asked. Uh, I'm a bit busy at the moment, I said desperately beating the crap out of the keyboard. It won't take a moment, he continued, unimpressed by my I'm busy doing important producer type things routine. I'm afraid we've got a bit of a situation and I need to talk to you. Goody, we had yet another situation. I wondered what it could be this time. Perhaps Danny had totally lost it and decapitated our props girl with a broadsword. By this point in the shoot, nothing would surprise me. It's Amy... Danny hesitated, and his expression went up a few notches on the grave and foreboding scale. It was just at that moment that I could have sworn I saw the lights dim, the fire blow out, and a squadron of Lucifer's demons race across the ceiling, yelling, Hurrah! Hurrah! Danny is a true disciple of Beelzebub! Or perhaps, given the events of the last few weeks, I was just very, very tired. Look! Can we go somewhere private? Danny whispered, realising that a small queue had formed behind him. Shit, maybe he had actually killed Amy, our outspoken New York prop supervisor. It was certainly true that only an hour earlier they had been entangled in some huge public spat about who was or wasn't doing their job properly. I wondered if my employer's liability insurance covered me for the dismemberment of a US citizen by a big, tall, camel-wielding twat. At a guess, probably not. I followed Danny out of the green room, down the hallway and into the vast main entrance hall. Right, Danny, so uh, what's the problem? Amy. Uh Uh-huh, so you said. And my coat. Uh, your coat, I said. Uh, Looks fine to me. I was certainly relieved that Danny hadn't begun with the words, Amy, she's dead. I lopped her head off with the broadsword. However, I did feel a certain unease about what was going to come next. Well, it isn't fine, James. Look, said Danny, turning around and presenting me with the back of his coat. I half expected to see the words, Danny is a conceited cunt, daubed on it in stage blood. But all I could see was the unremarkable sight of the back of Danny's coat. So, uh, is that the South face, then? I said, attempting to inject a smidgen of jocularity into the otherwise humour-free zone. That was Danny. What do you mean? came Danny's curt reply. Well, you see, on the front of your coat it says North Face. So, you know, I I was just being, you know, a bit fanciful by suggesting that the back of the coat could be the, um, the South Face. Danny's eyes narrowed into the sort of death stare that could take out a whole planet. Oh, oh, come on, Danny. I make joke. A bit feeble, I know, but, you know, work with me. I became aware of a small laser dot on my forehead and knew I was only seconds away from being vaporised. I don't see anything funny about having your possessions trampled on, Danny snapped, manoeuvring his towering frame towards me. Come again? I said in a squeaky, rodent-about-to-be-crushed sort of way. Amy threw my coat on the floor. Look, it's caked in dirt. Danny thrust his coat back into my face again. This was getting boring. I looked at the evidence. Yep, definitely a bit of dirt there. There was no doubt about it. Amy was obviously evil and must be destroyed. Well, uh, look, um, let me look into it, okay? I said. The offer to look into it was one of my stock answers, often employed on the shoot to counter any whiff of insurgency amongst the crew. It was great because it was an answer that held so much promise for the listener. 
it inferred that I was on the case and spending time getting my hands dirty trying to resolve the problem. It was also, plainly, complete bollocks. I had no real time on this shoot. I was stumbling and flailing from one harrowing moment to the next with barely a moment to reflect, prioritise, micromanage, delegate or do any of those other wonderfully indulgent things that big grown-up producers do. I wasn't so much the producer as the production bitch, whore, slag. Always up for it. Always willing to be buggered senseless as long as it meant we got the scenes actually shot. And when it came to me being really shafted up the arse, I could rest assured that Danny would always be there to oblige. Good, but at the very least I expect an apology from Amy, Danny demanded. Otherwise, ah, the not-so-veiled threat of quitting loomed its tediously familiar head again. Jesus, this looked like it was going to be the third time that Danny had threatened to walk. All I had ever wanted was a nice, happy production where everyone did their job and maybe, just possibly, got some kind of kick out of the fact that we were making a bloody feature film. I felt like telling Danny to just stop for one moment and reflect on how fortunate he was to be acting as director of photography on a proper movie. I mean, he was still in his twenties for Christ's sake. And we were shooting mainly in warm and cosy interiors. And those interiors happened to be the lush, opulent rooms of an English stately home. And he was getting paid, fed, watered and transported to and from location to a not unpleasant B&B. But, just like a needy child, it was never enough for him. Of course, I didn't read the riot act to Danny because I couldn't afford to lose him. With only a few days to go before the end of the shoot, it would have been a financial and logistical nightmare to find another DOP. Danny was embedded in the production, sewn into the fabric of the whole damn thing. And the bastard knew it. Otherwise, you're, um, going to go? I said tentatively. Well, I don't think I'd have much choice in the matter. It's the last straw, James. I'm a professional, and that sort of puerile behaviour by the head of another department is just, well, it's not something that I'd really expect I'd have to ever deal with. Well, sure, Danny. Like I said, I'll look into it. Five minutes later, and I was racing away from the location in my car. Having chaired a crisis management meeting with Lucy, my production manager, and after a methodical and thorough examination of all available options, I had decided to run away. Actually, my meeting with Lucy had gone a bit like this. Lucy, I've I've, I've got to go and hide. You what? I've, I've I've got to go and hide from Danny. Trust me, it's the it's definitely the only way. Lucy stopped what she was doing, which happened to be about a dozen different jobs and gave me one of her don't-even-think-about-it looks. You can't go and hide, she remonstrated. You're the producer. I need you here. Lucy underlined her plea by thrusting a half-finished, much-amended, coffee-and-fagash-stained bit of paper into my face. This was the call sheet for the following day's shoot. I gave it a perfunctory glance, which was enough for me to realise that there was no way on God's earth that we were ever going to get through that many scenes. I made a mental note. Buy fags, drink coffee, and butcher as much of the script as possible. Look, I'll I'll explain later, I said. And if if Danny asks where I am, can you tell him I've, you know, my my hamster's died or or my girlfriend's been taken hostage? I mean, anything really. Just, Just make something up, okay? I caught a glimpse of Danny lurking down the end of the corridor. If I was going to go, it had to be now. I gave Lucy the best reassuring smile I could muster and made a dash for the exit. When are you coming back? said Lucy, her voice quivering with something akin to desperation. Soon. Um, look, don't, don't worry, I'm, I'm not exactly fleeing the country, I answered. Though, of course, the thought had occurred to me. God, Lucy looked knackered. Where was the bright-eyed, fluffy-tailed girl that I had employed all those weeks ago? Hmm? What had I done to her? Actually, what had I done to so many of my production team? A quick glance around the room revealed an assortment of crumpled, sleep-deprived crew. There was Toby, my sound supervisor, deep in a coma with his face half-submerged in his sound kit. And there sat Kate, my makeup girl, with what appeared to be 
tear stains down her cheeks and one of those thousand-yard stares that shell-shocked soldiers have after enduring a bone-shattering bombardment. I felt the temptation to do one of my rounds, where I edified, consoled and encouraged the much-beleaguered troops. Then I thought about driving hell for leather away from it all and found myself virtually running down the steps towards the car. About a mile from the location, I pulled into the car park of the local hotel. My plan was a simple one. I would hold out here until the rest of the day's shooting had been wrapped. My thinking was that if I removed myself from within the reach of Danny, then he'd have no choice but just to get on and do his fucking job. Time was running out. The schedule was shot to fuck and we were desperately in need of a final push. It was a desperate plan for desperate times. I walked into the hotel foyer, ordered a cappuccino and headed for the plumpest, most arse-friendly chair I could find. Sinking deep into the yielding folds of the comfiest seat in the world, I closed my eyes and drifted off into pleasant pastures inhabited by small, furry creatures with cute wet noses and guileless, unblinking eyes. On a nearby speaker, Joe Bland and his orchestra was blithely murdering its way through a smorgasbord of show tunes. It was total, mindless bliss. Do you take sugar, sir? I sat up with a start. A waitress was leaning over me, brandishing a coffee and a question. Uh, yes, sir, uh, I, I think so. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, I blathered. Not a tricky question, really, but obviously tricky enough for me to get to grips with in my present degraded state of mind. The waitress placed the cappuccino on a low-lying table and gave me her best asylum nurse smile. I reciprocated with a lunatic's grin and tried very hard not to dribble. Would you like anything else to eat, sir? She inquired. I was aware that the waitress had a glint of pity in her eyes. I was also aware that not only was I drawn, haggard and uh, generally fucked, I was also sporting a grubby top with the words, Let me out of here. I can't fucking cope any more. This was actually a line taken from the film script that Lucy had printed onto some swag fleeces for the crew. I thought it was a pretty inspired move at the time, considering the fact that nearly every member of the crew had attempted some kind of runner during the last four weeks. There was something pleasingly ludicrous in watching a film technician spiral into a hissy fit while emblazoned with the words, I can't fucking cope anymore! Well, it stoked my coals at any rate. Well, uh, some sort of um, cake would be nice, I eventually responded. What sort of cake? She gently inquired in her soft, kind, you can trust me, I'm a medical professional voice. The icy hand of decision-making gripped around my throat and I was rendered speechless. I was running on empty. That's one of the awful things about being a low-budget film producer. You have to make decisions. Thousands of the little buggers. For the last 20 days I had been stalked by an assortment of cast and crew demanding my sage-like guidance on all manner of production issues. Problem was, as this was my first feature film, I didn't quite qualify for sage status. I was like one of those plucky 19-year-old Spitfire pilots with barely eight hours flying experience under my belt. Gung-ho, fearless and soon to be mightily arse whipped by a Messerschmitt 109 piloted by one Klaus von Killer bastard. Uh, a chocolate cake, please, I spluttered. OK, well, we've got a chocolate gatto, chocolate brownie. Yes, e either would be great, I hastily interjected. Actually, I think we've also got... Uh, the waitress paused for a moment to access a dusty recess of her cerebral cortex marked chocolate-flavoured cake alternatives. Oh yes, I'm, I'm sure we've got some chocolate-covered flapjacks, she continued. Although I don't think, strictly speaking, they qualify as cake. Probably not, I said, but fuck it, let's have a flapjack. Like a stun grenade, going off in the midst of a nativity play, my novel juxtaposition of fuck and flapjack had an immediate and ruinous effect upon the upbeat demeanour of the waitress. Right, a uh, flapjack it is then. Her reply was curt and terminal. For a brief moment it had been truly wonderful between us, but now it was over. Thank God. 
With the waitress no longer in my life, I was once more alone and ecstatically content. No more questions, no more demands. I closed my eyes again and let my mind wander off to the accompanying strains of Phantom of the Opera being slowly pummeled to death by a xylophone and maraca combo. And then my mobile rang. It was Danny. I tapped the little red napalm Danny icon and the phone fell silent, but not for long. Two minutes later it was ringing again. I was tempted to turn the phone off completely, but before I had fled for the hills, I had promised Lucy that I wouldn't do this, just in case something calamitous happened on location while I was away. Mind you, I had made sure that I had defined calamitous as nothing short of a direct nuclear strike. Over the next 15 minutes, the phone repeatedly rang while I repeatedly extinguished the calls. My only hope was that in between calling me, Danny was actually operating the camera and, bit by bit, images were being captured. That was all that mattered to me. Captured images that could later be arranged into something resembling a moving picture. I only had to keep the ship afloat for four more days. I only had to cajole, flatter, hide and, when the occasion demanded it, offer up my butt cheeks to Danny for just a little longer. We were so painfully close to actually having this bastard in the can. Danny called again. I was about to hang up for the umpteenth time when suddenly, from within the deep closed cloisters of my soul, a molten lava of righteous anger erupted to the surface. What? I snapped, answering the phone. Ah, at last, came the reply. It's Danny. Yes, I know. What is it that you want, Danny? I said firmly. I'm, I'm really busy at the moment. This was more like it. Fueled by an unexpected burst of rage, I had swung round to deal with the beast face on. I was Gandalf the wizard and Danny was the Balrog an ancient and malign creature that I must incinerate with the power of my magic staff. It was going to be an epic confrontation between light and dark, good and evil. Before I agree to do any more shooting, I need to know what you intend to do about Amy, said Danny. Ha! My time had come at last to smite this beast down. I would frazzle him with a single blast from my wizard's staff, and the world would rejoice and the dark scourge of the film set will be no more. Ha! Hooray for me! James, did you hear what I said? Danny continued. No more shooting until this situation is resolved. Uh, Yes, I heard heard you, Danny. Bollocks. I had had a clear shot, and I had hesitated. I found myself inching backwards towards a bottomless chasm. Look, Danny, um, I'll look into it. Okay? I said, realising that in one swift move... The Balrog had separated me from my testicles. But you've already said that, James. How much more time do you need? Uh, just a little bit longer, if, if that's all right. And with this, I stepped over the edge and plummeted down into the murky depths of self-loathing. The line went dead. For the time being, the beast was satisfied. I had secured a few more valuable hours, but once again I had sacrificed my integrity and been reduced to making lamb-like bleating noises in front of a 14-year-old. But fuck it, we were nearly there. The harbour was in sight and all I had to do was to coax the little beauty in. Who cared if I'd had to jettison a few things along the way? Things like pride, weight, friends, money, sleep, dignity, self-respect, scruples, personal hygiene etc. I it, I was making a movie. I was living the dream. I was starting to dribble and lose consciousness. Chapter 1 I'm having a director's meeting on Thursday. I'll get back to you with a definitive answer then, if that's okay. Thursday. Today was Monday. In three days' time, we would have a rock-solid answer. Steve and I exited the shiny foyer of the Dean's Cut and strode, nay, swaggered, down London's Dean Street. It had been a really good meeting. John Crozer, the main man of this particular post-production studio, had made lots of positive noises about supporting our filmmaking venture. If all went well, and his fellow directors played a ball, his studio would supply all our post-production needs along the lines of an in-kind investment in our film. 
That's got to be worth at least 50k, I said, wielding the letter K with all the panache of a seasoned movie-making player. Yes, it would certainly cover us for all our post costs, Steve replied. And it would also give us a lot of credibility with our cash investors. So, if all goes to plan, there's no reason why we couldn't start pre-prod in June, hmm? Gee, I was certainly brimming over with producer speak now. Maybe if I pepper my conversation with a lot more filmy words, I might yet miraculously transform into someone who knew what the fuck he was talking about. I don't see why not, Steve responded. I think we've got enough cash for the shoot, so hopefully with the post-production costs sorted, uh, we could crack on as soon as. Wow. Cripes. Blimey. It suddenly all looked possible. Two years of dicking around, trying to scrape together the budget for our film, and all of a sudden it actually looked as if we were on the verge of putting this thing together. We had a script. We had some cash. All we needed now was a a phone call on Friday confirming that the Dean's Cut were indeed willing to invest in the project. Fancy some lunch? I asked. Yeah, sure, said Steve. Shall we, um, splash out? I ventured. What, you you mean a sit-down affair? Yeah, why not? That was a really good meeting. We should celebrate. Ten minutes later, Steve and I were squeezed onto a couple of stools in a very busy Pret-a-Manger. So, do you think the uh, 70k we've raised for the shoot is uh, definitely going to cover everything? I said, tucking into my celebratory BLT. Well, uh, it's going to be fairly tight, Steve said, giving his tuna mayonnaise a good ponderous munch before continuing. We'll have to uh, keep the crew to a minimum and uh, we're going to have to work pretty fast. I had a burning desire to ask Steve lots of questions. For months now, I had been swatting up on the various how-to-make-a-low-budget movie books that I had accumulated. Unfortunately, much of what I had read had simply washed over me. The filmmaking process was steeped in ancient lore and seemingly impenetrable Masonic codes, and I was struggling to decipher some of the basics. I reckon we'll have uh, three weeks to get it in the can, continued Steve, which is, you know, possible if we work long days. Right, OK, and um, what about the E&O insurance? Do we, do we need that? Steve looked blankly back at me. This was disconcerting. I had no idea what E&O stood for, or why it was necessary, or why indeed I had suddenly and randomly mentioned it. However, one of my how-to books had referred to it, and as Steve had already directed and produced his own feature film, I presumed this was something he would know about. E and O insurance, he said slowly. Uh, It's not something I've come across, James. Uh, I I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. But I was worrying about it. I was also worried that Steve was not worrying about it. Then there was the matter of shoot ratios, production schedules, cast and crew contracts, camera lenses, on and offline editing, digital audio transfer and conforming, underscoring, colour grading, HMI, Flag knuckle and kino flow lights, car grips, best boys, gaffers, release forms, the copyright clearance, ADR, telescopic jibs, spotting lists, time code dialogue scripts. Are you all right, James? said Steve, looking concerned. You've gone a bit, uh, pale. <coughs> I spluttered with a large inhalation of air and lettuce. Sorry, I, I forgot to breathe there for a moment. Um, I, I was just thinking about all the things we've got to sort out for, you know, pre-prod. Oh, right, said Steve, nonchalantly. So, uh, what sort of things would they be, then? You know, pre-production type things, I said with mounting alarm. Oh, yeah, those, Steve replied vaguely. You know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about all that at the moment. When the time comes, it'll all fall into place. Steve gave me a reassuring smile, to which I responded with a totally unreassured grimace. The fact was, when Steve produced his first feature a few years back, he didn't really do pre-production. Having raised the finance, he set a shoot date and then just sort of let things happen. It was all very Zen meets Chaos Theory school of filmmaking. To everyone's surprise, including Steve's, the film not only cut together rather nicely, but went on to make some international sales. Pretty impressive for a director whose previous shooting experience had been confined to wedding videos and bar mitzvahs. But that was Steve. My approach was far less phlegmatic. I was a product of intensive anxiety farming and quite capable of being rendered immobile 
by an irrational bit of angst. Anything else troubling you? Steve asked. For a split second, there was nothing. The clouds parted and a little patch of blue appeared. Then the Sunderland Fret randomizer swung back into action and I found myself in a world of deep, dark obsessions. Actually, there is something, I said, having successfully found something to fixate on. Do you know what that fluffy thing's called that goes on the grey plastic thing that covers the long, pointy recording mic? Uh, isn't it just called the fluffy thing? Steve replied. I don't think so. I've got a feeling that it's called something like the the squirrel or something like that. Hmm. Isn't it a little bit too furry to be a squirrel? Unless, of course, it's a long-haired squirrel. I failed to catch the sardonic glint in Steve's eye. Big mistake. There's no such thing as a long-haired squirrel, is there? I said. Not now there isn't. Um, unfortunately, they're all extinct. But if my memory serves me right, they, they used to roam in large packs across the icy tundra of Siberia and Canada. Oh, right, I said. I was impressed with Steve's rodent knowledge. It went some way to making up for his ignorance about E&O insurance. So why did they become extinct? I asked. Well, as is the fate with many such species, James, they were hunted to extinction because of their fur. Surely you mean their hair? Yeah, uh, fur, hair, pelt, you know, whatever, said Steve. Anyway, perhaps some pioneering sound recordist was battling with wind noise while trying to record the mating growls of Siberian tigers and had the inspired idea of fashioning the pelt of a recently acquired long-haired squirrel into a wind-reducing cover for his boom mic. It seemed like a credible scenario. Perhaps I was right after all about the squirrel. I suddenly imagined being on set and casually mentioning it to a passing sound recordist. That would impress him. That would make him quietly respect me. Actually, that's all horseshit, said Steve. What is? Uh, Everything I was just saying about long-haired squirrels. Oh, I said, somewhat deflated. Really, James, you, you need to chill out a bit, you know? You can't be expected to know every little thing about film production. Yeah, you're right. Um, sorry, I said, feeling like an over-earnest twat. I mean, look what happened with me in my first film. I mean, I, I knew Jack shite, but somehow it all came together. Anyway, we're not quite there yet. Let's see how that director's meeting goes on Thursday, shall we? Thursday came and went without any news from John Crozer. Likewise, on Friday, diddly squat. I decided to call Steve. Hi, Steve. Um, still nothing from John Crozer. Oh, well, he's, he's probably been busy. Might be worth chasing him on Monday. Uh, what do you reckon then? Uh, a, a call or email? Or how about a casual yet concise yet insistent text? It's up to you, really, James, but I, I reckon a call would do it. Yes, but I don't really want to pester him. I mean, wouldn't a call at this stage be construed as pestering? Uh, I don't think so, James. <laughs> Maybe if you waited for him to finish work and then followed him home, perhaps that would be construed as pestering. But uh, a simple phone call would be OK, I think. Hmm, I'm not sure, I faffed. <laughs> Look, what does your boy's book of filmmaking say on the subject? Said Steve, toying mercilessly with my general rubbishness. OK, point taken. I'll I'll make that call. Excellent decision, Mr. Producer. Only four million more decisions like that and you'll have a film in the bag. Except I didn't. Call, that is. Come Monday, I spent a full hour constructing the following email to John. Dear John, great to meet with you last week. Steve and I are really excited at the prospect of the Dean's Cut becoming involved in our filmmaking project. Speaking of which, have you and your directors come to a decision regarding your possible in-kind investment in the film? I appreciate that you are probably very busy at the moment, and I'm sorry for chasing you like this, but it would be good to know if you have any further interest in our filmmaking venture. Once again, it was great to meet you and to be shown round your very impressive post-production facilities. Thanks for all your time and continuing interest in the film. I look forward to hearing back from you in the near future. All the very best. Yours, James Sunderland, producer.
I resisted the urge to put a smiley face beside my salutation and proceeded to spend a further fifteen minutes deconstructing my exquisitely honed epistle. I was particularly chuffed that I had somehow managed to juxtapose subtle prodding with equally subtle licking of the potential investor's bottom. I pressed send and nipped off to make a brew. On my return, I clicked the send and receive icon and was delighted to see a flashing envelope signifying the successful docking of a new and shiny email. Gosh, that was quick. John must have picked up my deftly crafted correspondence and been impelled there and then to respond. I opened the email and read the following. Dear Sir, my name is Chief Winston Wugu Umpalumpa of some obscure African state that I've just made up, and I would like to give you ten zillion dollars in exchange for all your passwords and account details, etc. I'm not making any real credible sense, as I can't really speak English and I can't con hustle dupe for toffee. But here I am hoping that some English sap might be checking his or her email while fiendishly high on drugs or booze, and therefore will be ripe for the plucking. Blah, blah, bollocks, blah, more bollocks, blah, big hairy bollocks, blah, blah, etc, etc, etc. Feeling a bit deflated, I deleted the email and busied myself rearranging my stationery. After another couple of hours, there was still no reply from John. It suddenly occurred to me that my email might have been consigned to John's junk folder, and so I decided to send him the following text. Hi, John. Not sure if you got my email. Can you confirm receipt? Best, James Sunderland, producer. The day wore on, and I whittled away the hours, creating complicated and colourful film production templates on my computer. As 6pm approached, I decided that perhaps a phone call might indeed be the way to go. I rang John's mobile, and after two rings I was put through to his voicemail. Hi John, it's it's James Sunderland here, uh, James Sunderland, the producer. Um, just a quickie, because I appreciate that you're probably very busy with preparing for CAD, but I, I was wondering if you'd picked up my email that I sent earlier today regarding potential investment in our film. Um, anyway, I can be contacted on either my landline or mobile numbers, or indeed Skype, or... Or, you know, or possibly even FaceTime, if, if that is something that, that you use. Uh, anyway, uh, the time now is 5.30pm, uh, and of course it's Monday, you know, the Monday after your director's meeting last Thursday. <laughs> ah. uh, anyway, again, it would be great to hear back from you, as we are currently trying to put the finishing touches to... Abruptly, the phone went dead. Bucker. There's something distinctly embarrassing about being cut off midstream by someone else's answer phone. It makes you feel like you've overstayed your welcome and that you are some kind of needy, clingy, desperate bastard. Which, of course, I, I was. As a producer, one should be precise and to the point. Time is money and all that. Unfortunately, at that point in my life, I had a lot of time on my hands and bugger all money. Sadly, I didn't work in a bustling office where magical film production stuff was woven together by the disciplined ranks of industrious staff. Instead, I was on my tod, fumbling around with a wheezing laptop and obsessing about the font size of my emails. In the end, three weeks passed before I finally got a response from John. John's chosen weapon was an email. James, very busy prepping for can, will get back, J. Compared to my lovingly crafted email, John's correspondence was brutal in its terseness. Still, it was at least some form of communication and therefore worthy of an over-excitable reply. Hi John, great to hear from you and thanks for getting back. I totally understand the fact that you must be busy prepping for can. Look forward to hearing from you when you have a chance. All the best. James Sunderland, producer. I decided to phone Steve with news of the development. Hi Steve, there's the, there's been a development. Oh right, uh, is it to do with John Crozer? Came Steve's uncharacteristically ebullient response. From nowhere, the Possibilities Express had thundered into view, and with whistle blowing and engines screaming, it was tearing up the tracks towards Green Light Central. Yes, I responded, giddy and breathless with excitement. He sent me a text saying that he was busy prepping for Cannes, but would get back soon. 
There was a long pause while Steve digested this development. Is that it? Steve said finally. Um, basically, yes, I said. So he hasn't said yes then? No, but then he hasn't said no either, I countered. True, true, yeah. I could hear Steve sifting through his mental waste bin looking for straws to clutch onto. It was precisely at this moment that the Possibilities Express jumped the track and ploughed headlong into a storage unit marked High Explosives. The ensuing explosion launched a fireball in the direction of Steve and I, who were waiting expectantly on Platform 1 of Greenlight Central. The two of us were cremated on the spot. Cut to close-up of charred Saver return ticket to Hollywood, being carried away on a light post-apocalyptic breeze. But it's bollocks, really, isn't it? said Steve in a cutting-through-the-crap kind of way. I mean, what's all this prepping for canned stuff? I mean, what's that when it's at home? And, and why is it all so all-consuming that he can't be asked to send us a straightforward yes or no answer? Maybe he's having to prepare a lot of marketing material, I preferred in a flimsy, girls' nightwear kind of way. Sure, yeah, and, and maybe he's, he's ironing creases into his beachwear or surfing the net for a de rigueur parasol for when he strolls down le croissant. Isn't it le croissant? Well, well yes, probably, but who cares? Came Steve's rather grumpy reply. I tried to think of something cheery to say. Unfortunately, the sparkling new dawn that was to be John Crozer and his in-kind finance had been replaced with an overcast and drizzling twilight, occasionally interrupted by the muffled guff of a farting, indolent wind. I suddenly doubted everything that John had told us at our original meeting with him. I think John's lost interest in us, I said. No shit, Sherlock. I bet he lost interest in us the moment we stepped out of his office. But he seemed so keen. Why? I mean, why would he say all that stuff about the director's meeting if, if he wasn't the slightest way interested? I don't know. Maybe for about two minutes he was genuinely interested and then his head was turned by something a bit more pretty and shiny. You know, a, a new stapler, perhaps, or possibly an ergonomically satisfying gum dispenser. I felt used and dirty not in a sexually interesting way. It was as if John had been carelessly toying with our dreams, with total disregard to how vulnerable we were to that slutty whore named Hope. I had a good mind to confront John Crozer face to face and scream foul things at him before then flouncing out of his office and slamming his door really, really hard. Fortunately, I didn't share these thoughts with Steve, as he would, no doubt, have sniggered a lot and told me to cease thinking like a prepubescent girl. So that's that, then. You, you think it's a definite no? I said. I hated broaching the question because, in my heart of hearts, I knew Steve's answer would depress me. No, I think it's worse than that. I think it's an indefinite maybe. What do you mean? I mean, I, I've come across people like John before. They won't say a definite yes, nor will they say a definite no. The answer will be consigned forever to the nebulous twilight zone of, yeah, it's possible, I suppose, maybe. Who are you? Hang on a minute. Look, look at that stapler. Isn't it shiny? So it's back to the drawing board then, I said. Ah, uh, I guess so. I detected a weariness in Steve's voice, born of months of attempting to fund the film. It had taken us two years to raise just £70,000, which, while of itself not exactly an insignificant sum, when viewed in the context of financing a 90-minute feature film, looked pretty weedy and insubstantial. We had to face facts. Neither of us really had the stomach to carry on the slog of trying to raise finance. We just weren't by nature the sort of wheeler-dealer folk that get a stiffy at the mere thought of doing a deal. In fact, such activity had the opposite effect on us. Severe wiltage of the manhood area whenever we got up all close and personal to the money men. As for trying to gain access to lottery funding, I had already been pulverised into fine granules by that particular mill. After assessment by the funding body's reader, our screenplay was deemed to be lacking in the following areas. 1. It wasn't set in Ireland during the potato famine or the Troubles. 2. It wasn't edgy, urban, now, street, or happening. 3. It wasn't written by Mike Lee. 4. It wasn't written by Ken Loach. 
Five, there didn't seem to be an obvious role in it for Kira Knightley. Six, it didn't involve a socially disadvantaged cripple of Estonian Islamic descent wandering round a grim northern stroke Welsh stroke Scottish town and being shat on by fascist white bigots before finally coming good and saving the steelworks stroke coal mine stroke grit processing factory from closure while at the same time wooing and winning the heart of Kira Knightley. In the past, I had spent very long and dreary days applying for all sorts of different national lottery-supported funds. These included the Premier Fund, the New Directors Fund, the Low Budget Fund, the film with lingering shots of Kira Knightley looking pretty but vacant fund, but to no avail. Our script just didn't raise their dough. We could always uh, max out our credit cards, I suggested. Too late. Already done that replied Steve. Yeah, uh, me too. There was little more to be said. It was over and we both knew it. Anyway, better get on, I said in a faux gusto sort of way. I might draw the net for European Union funding bodies, you know, worth a shot. My lusty enthusiasm wasn't fooling anybody, least of all myself. Sure, uh, good idea, and uh, and I guess I'd better finish editing together this montage sequence I'm doing for Jean and Robbie's wedding. I will always love you, I inquired. Uh, yes, James, I suppose in some ways I will always love you too, but uh, let's not broadcast that fact too loudly, shall we? No, 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 no. The Whitney Houston song, I Will Always Love You, isn't isn't that what the happy couple have selected for their montage? Oh, right. Sorry, no. No, no, it's that song from um, Titanic. What's it called? Oh, you mean the one by Celine Dion? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's the one, yeah. A, a, a real tearjerker, that one. Very popular choice amongst newlyweds, actually. But bit of an odd choice, don't you think? Uh, why is that, then? Well, doesn't it have rather tragic connotations? How so? Well, well, you know, along the lines of a ruddy big boat being torn open by an iceberg and thousands of people drowning in freezing darkness. Those sort of tragic connotations. Steve took a moment to reflect. Oh, yeah, yeah. Guess guess you're right. Hadn't really thought about it like that before. Huh? Kind of bleak, really. Perhaps in the, in the future I should shoot them on green screen and add a sinking liner in the background. You know, the end frame could be a shot of the traumatised groom gripping onto the sign SS Blind Panic (laughs) as he bobs off towards the horizon. I chuckled, enjoying the momentary distraction of Jean and Robbie's nuptials. Alas, as soon as I replaced the receiver, a large tub of acrid tar-like gloom landed on my head and began to ooze its way into my every pore. I clicked open the folder marked Film on my laptop, and with an increasingly heavy heart, browsed through the different production templates that I had so lovingly created. They were beautiful to behold, encompassing everything from call sheets, production schedules, daily and weekly progress reports, through to petty cash forms and location movement orders. It didn't really matter that I didn't know what half of them were for. I had breathed life into them, and had given these forms form. And for what? For now, that's what. My templates would be forever barren and unfulfilled, and my producing career would turn out to be yet another pipe dream that had fizzled, spluttered, and then made a lame pa sound before being finally extinguished. I was quite the collector of half arsed ambitions, and had, over the years, tried my hand at music, acting, directing, and writing. In each of these disciplines I had got so far, and then faltered, partly through encountering some sort of practical obstacle like destitution, and partly due to the crippling nature of self-doubt. It seems to me that if you want to achieve something in the arts, then you've really got to believe that you have the blessing of every god, muse, sprite, and tooth fairy going. I mean, how else can one explain the tsunami of self-belief encountered in shows such as The X Factor and Britain's Got Talent? Wrongly or rightly, I just wasn't blessed with that level of assuredness. I I would have the occasional moment of, oh, that was quite good. But then my confidence would be exposed to a light, critical wind and break up into little pieces. In the face of yet another dream being routed, I knew I had to make a stand. 
This was it. I had just turned 40, and so it was either now or never. So, no more half-heartedness, no more fleeing the front line whenever the battle got a bit too muddy and noisy for me. It was time to gird up my loins, draw my sword and charge into the fray, screaming WAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAA
I was momentarily thrown by Anne's direct line of questioning. Uh, well, it, it depends on the kind of producer you are. I mean, there, there are lots of different types. Right, so uh, what type are you? Well, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a, damn it, she was good, or I was shit, or it was a mix of the two. I mean, are you the type that makes money, she said. This was a deliberate, totally uncalled for, and utterly below the belt taunt, which deserved a well aimed and withering retort. How dare she pee on my parade? This was meant to be a time for celebration and rejoicing, not for bringing up that old hoary, so when are you ever going to make any real money, chestnut? I'm, I'm, I'm going to my office, I stropped, slamming shut my laptop and striding out of the room an action that didn't quite qualify as the withering return of fire that I had intended. You mean my spare bedroom? Anne called after me, making sure we were all clear on whose apartment this really was. I squeezed my way past the single bed that occupied most of the box room and sat down at my Toys R Us desk. In front of me lay my desk diary open at January. I selected a green highlighter and marked all the relevant pages through to the end of February. Green for go. Green for green lit. Green for the enormous lawn that I would soon be overlooking once I'd cashed in the spoils for my global box office success. Green for inexperienced, foolhardy and fucking naive, sang out a large chorus of voices in my head. Piss off, I said out loud in a sound rebuke to my gathering demons. This time it would be different. This time I would stick to my guns and see something through to the end, bitter or otherwise. Outside, the wind had picked up and a loose piece of guttering was banging out a rhythm on the window. I imagined the same wind, filling the sails of my ship and leading me out towards the horizon. There was no going back this time. No capitulation when the going got tough. I was going to make this film, even if it killed me. Drama queen, continued the chorus in my head. Fuck off, I retorted. 